God, we thank you for your spirit. That you're ever with us. You said you would never leave us or forsake us. God, we sent your presence in this place today. In Jesus' name. Hi. What a joy it is to get to be here today with you guys. My life is back in the PowerPoint going this morning. My name is Tim Leathers, my wife Tammy. I'll be up here in just a few minutes. We are U.S. missionaries, chaplains um, to Lighthouse. And we, it's, what a joy it is to get to be here today with you. And uh, we are, I, I can't um, tell you enough how great this is to be with you. And I want to tell you how fortunate you folks are to have such incredible pastors that you have. Um, Pastor Darren and Pastor Marcia are incredible friends of ours. And, um, matter of fact, just a second, Tammy's going to tell you a little how we know these guys and how precious they are to us. And uh, so we're just excited to get to be here today. Um, I am we are uh, the former pastors of, of Heartland Fellowship Church in Wilton, Iowa, which is 30 miles down the road. And uh, last Sunday was our last Sunday to be the pastors there. And you got to the first church that we get to come into to tell you what God is doing through Lifehouse. And I'm also the retiring chief of police in Wilton, Iowa. Um, Christmas Day, I will be fully retired as the chief of police for the last 15 years. Um, I have been bivocational, doing two things. My wife was the woman's home director for a ministry uh, with ladies that were struggling with substance abuse. We'll share a little bit more about that and why God has led us to this incredible ministry that uh, we want to share with you guys today. Good morning. It's so glad. I'm so glad to be here today. and We've really looked forward to coming to this church. Like Tim said, um, We've known, we've known Marsha, we know her as Marsha Dunn, back in the day. Uh, when we first went to Heartland 17 years ago, we took on our first missionary, and it was Marsha to Cambodia. And we got to pour into one missionary for a long time, and it was just such a blessing to us to have her. And she is just a sweetheart. You guys are so blessed Amen. to have her. Amen. Give him a hand. Yes. <laughs> and then getting to know Pastor Darren through her now and this wonderful relationship that they have as husband and wife and what a blessing that is. And when we first started this journey earlier this year on deciding on go, becoming missionaries for the Assemblies of God, U.S. missionaries, the first people we thought of is let's go sit down with Marsha and Darren and let's talk to them about it. So we met them for dinner at Cracker Barrel and we sat and told them our heart and said, what do you think? Are we crazy? What are we doing? And they they just poured into us yeah. and let us know that we're on the right track. And if this is what God's calling us to do, then this is what we should do. So we appreciate you guys so much. And we're also blessed to know the difference. Um, back when we were youth pastors almost two decades ago in Rock Island, uh, they were at the church there. And we got to be the youth pastors of their daughters. And that was such a blessing, too. So it's good to see you all as well. So um, just to get some of this stuff out of the way. We do have a table in the back, so at the end of service, if you'd like to stop by, pick up brochures, um, a card, anything that you'd like to pick up, please do. Anything on the table is yours except the television. <laughs> uh, I won't put a limit on that, not the television. But we also have little postcards back there talking about our open house that we're going to have at Life House. On December 15th, it's an open house, come and go from 4 to 7, so you're also welcome to take one of those, and please come and join us. We're going to have prizes and, and hors d'oeuvres, appetizers, so um, come and join us for that, too. So, like I said, it's great to be here today, and I want to tell you a little story. This is Heather, and Heather, as when she was a young girl, was abused, not by a family member, but by someone outside the home. And through that episode, Heather struggled. And not having anyone around her that knew Jesus and told her about Jesus, she turned to other things. And by the time she was 15 years old, she was a full-blown drug addict. And as she got older, it got worse and more involved and more drugs and different things. She ended up having three children. And as her addiction got worse and worse and worse, she ended up not having enough money to support 
And so she had to do something to support it. And what she did is she turned to people and started befriending them and forging their signature and stealing their identity. And where does that lead you? It leads you to jail and eventually prison. And that's where Heather ended up. And we have, through, um, through prisonpolicy.org, we have some, uh, some different statistics here. 1.9 million women were released from prison or jails in 2016. Research makes clear that women returning from prison or returning home from prison have a significantly higher need for services than men. Women who can't secure safe housing by, may return to abusive partners or family situations for housing and financial reasons. And according to reports, interventions should provide a safe, respectful environment, promote healthy relationships, address substance use, trauma, and mental health issues, provide women with opportunities to improve their socioeconomic conditions, establish comprehensive and collaborative community services, and prioritize women's empowerment and provide help for family reunification. Well, that's what we do at Lifehouse. We take women into our home and we help them reset, restore, and recover from substance abuse. But we do it by one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Because we know that government programs are out there, but it's not helping not helping. And so we know that Jesus is the answer. So our mission statement at Lifehouse is, Lifehouse exists to provide an encouraging and safe environment to empower women on a journey to seek improvement in their health and give them hope and freedom from strongholds through education and spiritual direction so they can find their purpose through Christ and live a productive and addiction-free life. Amen? Amen? So we, um, we bought a home. <laughs> My husband and I built a home for our retirement a few years back. Thought this is where we're going to retire. We're going to retire from the ministry. He's going to retire from the police department. Then we're going to buy a fifth wheel and we're going to travel and spend time with our grandkids and go to the beach. You know, that type of thing. <laughs> and God said, no, you're not. My plans are higher than your plans. And so um, God got a hold of us and said, this is what you're going to do. So we sold our house. <laughs> that we have built for our retirement. And God opened up this wonderful place that it, it, there's a picture of behind me here. This is an almost 6,000 square foot home that we can take into up to 12 women into our home. And right now we're going to start with four and then we're going to expand a little bit more. But uh, we just closed on the house a few weeks ago. We've been living there since July. And it is just absolutely a blessing from right. God. A blessing from God. It was, it was a financial step, but it still is exactly what we need for what we're doing. Because you got to have a place for them to go. This is out in the country. It's quiet. It's serene. We have wildlife. It's very nice. <laughs> so um, the next picture is Tim and I in front of our wonderful new home that God has blessed us with. But how many of you know that a lot of people who meet people that are coming out of addiction kind of look at them like, well, they caused their own problem, right? They're the ones that chose to take on, you know, to start doing drugs. They're the ones that chose this lifestyle. Why are you pouring so much effort into these people who chose to abuse their bodies like they have? And I'll tell you that most of them had no choice. And I know that sounds like a big statement to say, but when you've grown up with abuse and you've grown up with dysfunction, and in situations that you and I may never even comprehend the, the horrible things that they've been through, and you have no one to tell you about Jesus, you're going to find a way to numb yourself. And many times they turn to drugs and alcohol to do that. And for no fault of their own, chose a lifestyle. Maybe even at young, watched their parents do the same thing and walked right in their footsteps. And they need a place to go, and they need a society that doesn't say, you know, we don't, we don't want to help you, you did this to yourself. They, they feel discarded, and we want to show them that Jesus loves them and that there's victory through him. So this next picture is Heather. Heather came to me, and she, uh, she didn't know anything about Jesus at all. And um, one day I had the girls go in and watch uh, the Bible 
Bravo series on Netflix. I said, go in, watch a little bit of it. I was working in my office on some things because I, that's what I, I have office work to do. And she was in there watching it, and she came running into my office, and she said, Tammy, you're not going to believe this, but there was these three guys, and they were in a furnace, and they didn't even catch, they didn't even catch a fire, they didn't even get hurt, and Jesus was in there with them. And I said, I know, isn't that so cool? And so she left my office, she went back into the other room. She came in a little bit later, and she said, Tammy, there was this guy, he was thrown in with lions, and they didn't even eat him, God protected him. And I said, I know, don't we serve a big God? So I tell you what, we may be helping these girls, but these girls give us joy like you would not believe. To watch them transform and to watch them get excited about things like Bible stories that we've heard ever since we were little and get so excited about it. So Heather came to know Jesus. These are her three children that she had um, didn't have a good relationship with. And then this next picture is also a picture of her and her grandbaby. Look at that. Look at that smile on her face. So Heather is still working out her relationship with Jesus, as we all do. She has her ups and downs, but she knows that Jesus loves her, and she knows where to go when she's struggling. And that's, that is success we consider at Lifehouse. We provide 24, 24 hours, seven day a week camp. We are a one-year program. The girls go through our program through different phases, and phase as they um, as more trust is established, as they feel better in their recovery, they get to move into different phases. We can take up to 12 women. How many disciples did Jesus have? Wow, how cool is that? Um, so a cost per day is about $25 per day per woman. That sounds huge, but it's not, considering the fact that we are not only helping that woman with all her physical, mental, and spiritual needs, providing food and care and anything that she needs, but we are also changing a generation ahead of her. Amen. As she deals with her own children, it teaches them about Jesus Christ and breaking the cycle and the curse of addiction. Yes, that is, a, that is a blessing. Because I'm telling you, it can be a curse. And you can Amen. see it happen generation after yeah. generation. And we want to see that curse broken in the generations to come from these women. And these women raise up their children in the fear and ad admonition of the Lord. You guys sang a song today talking about hope arises out of the ashes. That's what we're hoping yeah. for Lifehouse, that hope arises out of the ashes of these lives. Um, so, okay. We're excited about Lifehouse, and as I said earlier, as a police officer, uh, give my beautiful wife a hand. Oh, hand. Oh, yeah. 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 I've spent the last 15 years putting people in jail. Now we can spend the rest of our lives helping release people from the prison walls. And there's nothing more exciting than that is to see the captive set free. And we're excited about Lifehouse and what God's called us to do. Um, and, and we are super excited that God's called us to be missionaries. He's called us to be chaplains, that we get to pour into these ladies' lives. Uh, the home that, that you see just a few minutes ago, we have our own apartment on the side of the house. Um, so, And the women will be in the other Big, the big part of the house. And it's perfect for what God is called to do. And God has performed miracle after miracle for us to do this. And, and I love what's on the wall in, in your foyer. It says this, experiencing God is what your church is all about. This morning we come into this place and we experienced the presence of God. Aren't you, aren't you thankful that when, when Jesus said, you know, I, it's expedient that I go away, that he can just go to heaven and say, hey, good luck, everybody. He said, no. He said, I'm going to send my comforter. Holy Spirit's going to abide in great things you're going to see done in our, in our, in our lifetimes as Christians. And loving people, as, the, as a motto of your, of your, on, your, the, on your wall says, that, that we are called to love people. When we see Jesus' life, he always met spiritual needs. He met, I mean, he met physical needs as he was meeting spiritual needs. He would meet people where they were at and sharing freedom together is on your wall. And that's what we're excited about but you see, there's a problem in this world, and I, I want to, to just bring the word of God to you for these next few minutes if I can. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. How many have the Bibles this morning? Got your Bibles with me? Awesome. Turn with me. Um, there's a portion of scripture here that uh, I want to read to you, and I want us to, to, to look at. 
that really begins to explain what's going on in this world since the foundation of the world. When God created Adam and Eve, there was this, this thing that began to happen after the fall. And here's what it says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. It says this, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbeliever to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what was proclaimed is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your word this morning. God, in these next few minutes, God, I pray that your word would penetrate our hearts, our minds, and our spirits today. God, may we be able to see what's going on in our world around us. And God, may we, as your children, that carry your light, understand what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. This portion of scripture is telling us that the world has a veil over their faces, over their eyes, over their minds. And as we watch the news around us, as we watch what's going on, it's so evident that people are blind to God. The world is filled with people that are, that are like blind people walking around the world with no idea where they are going. Matter of fact, some even celebrate their blindness. And, and if you really stop and look at that scripture, we stop right there. We say there, there is no hope for this world. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I watch the news, as I see this world kind of just going downhill, I start thinking, oh, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I just, we just want, I want out of here. Did anybody else, else do that? Am I the only one? Oh, just sometimes I go, oh, Lord, let's, man, I'm ready to go. Because this world is just getting worse and worse. I can't believe in the last uh, 15 years that I've been a police officer to see the things that are going on. The things that are celebrated. The sin that is, so, that is so celebrated today. And the people are walking around this world blind. And in their blindness they begin to look for answers. You see, we are designed as people with a hole in our spirits. There's a hole inside of each person ever uh, created, ever born. That There's this hole that people begin to try to fill that hole in their life with something. Some people turn to, to drugs, some to alcohol, other things that they begin to turn to. And you see that, that what the scripture is talking about is as, as people are so blinded that, number one, the world is blind to God's love. Matter of fact, even today we see what's happening around the world in China. Christians are being persecuted, being killed. So many are being martyred for the cause of Christ. And people aren't seeing God's love. The scripture talks about how Satan has blinded the hearts and the minds of people. To, to the point that sin is celebrated. And then people, as they celebrate in their sins, they find themselves caught in addictions. They say that 46% of all of us know someone who is caught in addiction. Whether it be alcohol or drugs or some other addiction. Every one of us in this room probably knows someone who is struggling with addiction. And the thing about addiction is, is that that satanic hold that happens in lives that... That, that gets such a grip on them that there is no hope for them because of their blindness. So, so you're saying, Pastor, this, 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 this the sermon this morning is, a, is a pretty much a downer. According to the world, yeah, it's a downer. But let me, let me just tell you this, that number one, God's love must be seen through us. How, how, how is people's veils going to come off of their eyes 
Is God going to miraculously just going to strike down and, and, and things are going to begin to happen where God's going to say, uh, church, we're not doing a good enough job, so I'm going to have to. God does that every once in a while. Sometimes God grips, grabs somebody from the pits and the, and the clutches of hell and pulls them out miraculously by his spirit. But you see, the way God wants to work today is through you and me. That's what the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is all about. Amen. Matter of fact, Jesus said this. He said, greater works are you going to do. Great. You see, we have the opportunity as spirit-filled people. Jesus was excited to go away. He had fulfilled what he had, has, had come to do. That was to be the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. But he said, I am going to send my comforter, the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity. He's not the third and last. He is the, the, he is the one. That God's Spirit, Jesus Christ, the three in one, has come to abide in us. That outpouring that happened on the day of Pentecost is still available to us. And that infilling of the Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. And I, that you see, we get to be the ones now to go into this dark world and begin to help pull the veil off of blind eyes. Hallelujah. You see, we want pastors to do that. We want evangelists to do that. But, but you see, that, that's, that's limiting the power of God. God says, I, I want to take you. I, I want you to be that person that God's love must be seen in you and me. We can't be grumpy Christians that stand around and with a sign that says turn or burn. You see so many people, we want to look at the sins of the world and say, oh, you better come know Jesus Christ or you're going to go to hell. In, in our little town, we have a guy that loves to stand on the street corners every time we have a festival and tell people they're all going to hell. And I said, they just go, oh, that's not going to work, my friend. You see, the, God's love, God's power must be seen in us. And point number four is God's love must be seen in us. Through us. You, you see, it's one thing for the Spirit of God to dwell in us, but God's not content with just dwelling in us. He says, I'm going to dwell through you. That, that he said, my Spirit is going to abide in you, that we can go into a dark room and expel the darkness. What the scripture, they talked about just a few minutes ago. Let light shine out of dark. You see, this morning, if we were to shut all the doors and cover all the windows, and this room was pitch black. Have you ever been in a pitch black room? It was so dark that you could almost feel the darkness. It was so dark. One time I got to go down into a mine, and we were down inside this mine. And they said, okay, we're going to shut the lights off. And not only are you going to see the darkness, but you will feel the darkness. And it was true. When they turned the lights off in that mine, we were about 300 feet underground, they shut the, dark, shut the lights off. It was dark. We were in this huge cavern room, and it was echoing among in the building, in the room there. <coughs> they shut the light off, and they said, put your hand in front of your face. You couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. And all of a sudden, in the middle of that dark cavern, the guy lit a candle. Inside that dark cavern, one little light began to shine. And that one light expelled the darkness. You see, that one little candle took power and precedence over the darkness. And that same, that same analogy that I give you there is the same thing with us. Is the Spirit of God dwells in us and we go in and we dispel the darkness. Not because of us, but because Christ lives in us. And that the world has got to see Jesus in someone. If not through you, then through who will, he, will they see? If not through us as a church, then who is going to do it? You see, there's churches on every corner, but some just praise and, and glorify a historical God. They're, this morning, there's nothing more than a his, history lesson going on. They don't believe in the power. They don't believe in the glory of God. They don't believe that God can change. They don't believe that we can pray and, 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 and God's hand can move in the midst of the darkness and dispel it. We, we've got to realize that, that we, as spirit-filled people, in a spirit-filled church, that the Spirit of God lives in us, and He wants to not just live in us, but He wants to live through us. Say, well, how can you get involved in that? Wherever, wherever God plants you, that's where you need to shine your light. If it's in your factory you work at, in that office place, in that classroom, in, that, in, that, uh, in, the, in your neighborhood, in that retirement home, wherever you live at, that's a place where God says, that's your platform, that's your pulpit for you to shine light in the dark world. 
And then God gives us opportunities to get involved in areas